Hello and welcome back. Hello and welcome back. Okay, usually I like to be authentic and record the intro before I start building circuitry, but on this occasion I thought it'd be fun to do that. Okay, so in this video we're going to be talking about digital to analog and analog to digital conversion. In the previous video, we touched on it a bit using the 555 timer technique, detecting resistance, but we're gonna do some circuitry today which deals with testing and generating voltage. Let's have a play. I'm gonna start with digital to analog conversion, and we've got eight output bits that we're feeding into these LEDs. And I'm gonna use this R2R resistor ladder. Now I've talked about these before in both the audio series and the VGA series, so I'm not going to spend lots of time on that. And I'm going to use this prefabricated R2R ladder package. Let's just bring these out. And we need to tie the loose end to ground but then we should have our 8-bit value converted into a voltage between 0 and 5 right here on the end. I'm going to fire up my oscilloscope and we're just going to use that to confirm the voltage. I'm going to put a trigger on that output load line and then trigger it on the rising edge. Okay, so FF is 255. That should give us the five volts. 80 should put us in the middle. That looks about right. Okay, so we've got the digital to analog conversion going with just this one resistor ladder being added. That's pretty cool, but I'd like to write some code to drive it directly rather than just using the console commands. And we might be able to get it to do something slightly more interesting. This will initialize C to zero, then we're just going to decrement it. When it loops all the way back around to zero, we stop. I've got that wrapped in my standard code with the exit check. Okay. Now I've just created this table of sign values that go from zero to 255, and I'm going to use this loop to output entries from here. Give that a go. Right now, triggering the scope for every load is no longer the right thing to do. Let's get the blue trace back out of there. All right, that looks pretty good. We've got a little bit of noise on our sine wave, but it's, it's there. I'd like to get more consistent triggering though. I think we should use a more direct method to trigger our trace. Okay, so I put the purple line into a currently unused IO port. That's actually the one I normally have assigned to VGA. So I'm just gonna put a read from the VGA port there. Okay, so now on the trace, we see that line. So if we switch channel two to trigger it, we've got a way more stable look at our sine wave. That's good. Right, now I'm pleased with this, but we're currently using both traces on the oscilloscope, and I think we could do with an extra one, and I don't have a four channel scope. So I'm gonna pause at this point and show you something I've been experimenting with recently, which is really handy. On the front of the oscilloscope is this additional BNC connector for an external trigger. And I've kind of been aware that was there, but I haven't really made much use of it. But I've made up a cable, and I'm gonna plug this line in where the purple trace is currently connected. 
So now I can switch to the EXT trigger and it's now working exactly as it was before, but my purple line is unused. So I'm going to plug that into the second from highest bit. And what's interesting is we can now manipulate this and see exactly what it's doing in the binary. So we can see we've got two data sources being plotted on the oscilloscope and the external trigger is letting us control what section of the timeline is being displayed. Okay, so we've got the digital to analog conversion going and I'd like to talk about analog to digital conversion. In the last video, we did a very simple form of that using the 555 timer and we detected a resistance by measuring the charge time of a capacitor through that resistor. Now that method was simple, but effective. In fact, it's pretty much exactly what this old PC joystick interface did. But we're effectively counting there and that doesn't scale very well. I mean, a four bit input would be very easy and quick. If we increase that to eight bits, we're going to have to count up to 256 times. But if you think about how that would scale to 16 or 24 bits, it gets very rapidly virtually impossible. And so I would like to look at more direct ways of doing analog to digital conversion. And this D to A converter was a first step. So I want to start off by looking at this LM393 voltage comparator. Now, if you actually look at the diagram for a 555 timer, it contains two voltage comparators. And this is just a standalone chip with two of them. Okay, so this comparator is a simple eight pin device. It's got the voltage and ground inputs. You've got um, the output and then two inputs per comparator. And the logical output is very simple. If one voltage is greater than the other, then the output is high, otherwise it's low. Now observant people will realize this looks quite a lot like an op amp. In fact, the circuit of them is essentially a simple op amp, but it's configured in such a way as to always go to the high or low output rails. Let's give it power and ground. Now I'm gonna pull the inputs of the second device down. But then one of these inputs can be a digital to analog converter output and we need another input. So I've got the potentiometer I was using in the demos in the last video. Now rather than trying to detect a resistance, we want to detect a voltage. So I'm going to put the two ends of this into VCC and ground, forming a voltage divider. Let's have a look at that. Okay, so at the very top end, it gets a little bit more noisy, but We've got a reasonably fluid control between ground and, uh, and almost the top. Let's feed that into the second input and let's take a look at what we get from the result. Right, okay, so that's not changing very much. So the output of this device is actually open collector, so I need a pull up resistor. Right, that's much more what I expected. Okay, now the sine wave was pretty, but I'm going to change that to a straight line. Okay, so that's easier to visualize. So as we change the voltage on the potentiometer, we see the signal we're getting out of the comparator change up and down. So we could make a circuit very similar to the previous analog to digital converter we built by changing the output of the D2A in a straight line ramp like this, and then just tracking using an input line when this changes. And then that would give us an idea of the voltage. But the clever people following will realize there's a better way we can do that by using a binary search of the voltage. Before we go on though, this signal is feeling a bit noisy. So let's add a decoupling cap there. One down there didn't make much difference. So a lot of this noise is coming across from the CPU. So I'm just gonna try and reduce that by bypassing the circuit slightly. Right, so let's try and be more clever about this. 
I'm going to leave that VJ read. Now remember that's not doing anything for the operation. We're just taking the assert line from the VJ IO port as a way of triggering our oscilloscope so we can see this bit nice and clearly. Now we're going to start by setting A to 128. So that's the top bit. So we output that value to the digital to analog converter. And then we're going to read the result from the comparator in and that will tell us if the value is more or less than the 2.5 volts that that 128 will generate. Now that change was an instant so I'm going to put a few knobs in there and our in will overwrite A so I'll oh, worry about that in a sec. Right, so B is our test value. Stick a copy of that in A, write it out, check there. If it's higher we want to keep it. And we want to clear that bit. Can't do that. Um, Okay, so we set the top bit, do the comparison, clear it if necessary. So we shift D down and then we're just going to rinse and repeat this. We need to do it eight times. We need to start B at zero. So in theory now, B is our result. And output it. Okay. Um, let's give that a go. Okay, so our output needs to go to our top bit. Oh, hang on, that's uh, we've got pull down resistor here. And we're fighting it. That's better. I want the purple line to show our input. I think that's working. Didn't mean to leave that ramp loop in there. Right, so it definitely goes wrong right up the top. I think that's the limit of what the comparator can do, but over the most of the range it's working quite nicely. You can actually see this process of successive approximation. That's really cool. And the output is much more stable than what we were getting from the capacitor charging technique. Oh, that's brilliant. Okay, so what we've done there is we've built a fully functional binary search analog to digital converter and I believe this is actually the way most modern A to D converters work that you would find in regular circuits. Now obviously if we could make a bigger resistor ladder we could get a lot more bits out of this with only a very small amount of extra time. So each time we doubled the each time we added one bit to the D to A converter we add one extra step to the loop but we double the number of values that we can get out of this converter. I think we need to do something more interesting than this. Let's try sound. 
Okay, so I've got a very basic microphone here. I've got that going through a microphone preamplifier, and this should give me a approximately line signal level for the mic. Right, a little bit of a hand wave here. It took me a while to get this piece of offset circuitry working, but we've got the audio input goes between plus and minus 2.5 volts, and our analog to digital converter takes zero to five volts. So what I've put here is an op amp. I've got a voltage divider set to two and a half volts as the offset, and so this moves the range into the range that the analog to digital converter works in. Let's have a quick look at the code. Okay, so this took me a little while, but um, I've got two simple functions here. I've written functions to both sample 256 samples and to play it back just by feeding the same data back to the GPIO ports for the digital to analog converter. Now, both of these functions do 256 entries at a time and they record to DI and playback from the address SI. Now, if I do 128 of those calls, that's going to fill 32 kilobytes of my memory. Let's give that a go. Okay, so we're executing the first chunk of code that's gonna do the record. Testing, testing, one, two, three, testing. Now I'm gonna turn the speaker on. I'm gonna move the input to the yellow trace on the scope over to the output, just so we can see what it's doing. And let's uh, run the code that plays it back. Okay, well, audio quality is not brilliant, but there's lots of things working against us there, but I'm overjoyed that we actually got this working. Proves the analog to digital converter is doing its job, and it proves I probably shouldn't be an audio engineer. Okay, I really enjoyed that. It was a very rewarding bit of circuitry to build. Now, I think the overall audio quality at the end there was very limited by my poor speaker, my terrible microphone that I'm using here, but also just the overall way I was offsetting the voltage there was not quite the right way to do it. But don't let that detract from the underlying principle of the analog to digital and digital to analog conversion circuits we built here, which I think was very successful. Playing around with the audio at the end was just a bit of fun. As always, thanks a lot to my patrons. I really do appreciate the support. And I hope everybody found this interesting. I'll see you again soon. Goodbye. Before we leave this alone, let's play with it just a little bit more. So when I first wrote this code, I didn't quite get the timing right, so it was coming out wrong, and you didn't get a chance to see that as I was doing it. So let's have a quick play now. Now this, I've just disassembled the playback code, and that mov a comma 96 is part of a delay loop. <laughs> That's very close to what I first had, actually. Okay, that's pretty cool. Now, I don't want to mess around with the audio too much because this video was supposed to be about the actual analog to digital and digital to analog conversion. And I don't want to give people the impression I'm adding sound sample data to my audio subsystem, that would be quite easy. But these tiny little sound samples we're doing here are very low bit rate and they're taking half the memory on the system. So it really isn't practical for this kind of system. All right, see you soon. Goodbye.